Hi, my name is uh, Timothy Gager and welcome to Virtual Friday's um, Dire Literary Series. And tonight, uh, my special guest is uh, Alethea Dramer and um, we'll show a little bit of something. Uh, we will, uh, oh, you know what, we'll do this. How about this? Okay, we will uh, show everybody, instead of uh, the good thing about um, Zoom and not live readings is you don't have to, you don't necessarily have to read that canned, gone are the canned bios. But um, so what you can do if you're interested in um, Alethea is go to her website, which looks like this. And there's some great, great stuff here. And uh, I did have her bio up just in case. Um, But it's, uh, yeah, we're, we're professionals, really professional crew here. What happens is the, the Zoom dashboard blocks out all my tabs. So I have a problem. Well, let's see, I'll do it by memory. Alethea Dramer started writing when she dis discovered her father's box of poetry when she was 10 years old. And from that point on, she was enthralled with writing. She has edited or co-edited many, um, online journals, uh, including uh, As I Got My Coffee, uh, Durable Goods, um, and uh, my, my personal favorite, In Between Altered States. She's also um, published uh, books of poetry. The most recent is Running Red Lights, and coming soon is a f and also, sorry, the full length, Looking at Wild Things. Um, other books of hers, oh, there it is. See how I did, I, I think I hit all the bullet points. But uh, uh, she started writing, discovering her father was a poet and that a person could transfer the world they sit, see into words. As a young girl, poetry taught her how to connect with other people. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Alethea Kramer. <laughs> well, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm gonna read a little bit from my new book, Running Red Lights. Um, I do have another book coming out in the fall called Layers of Half-Sung Hymns from Cajun Mutt Press. And it's kind of, it'll be a sad book. It's a book about grief um, from the loss of parents and those good things. But, um, Daughter Snap Books is putting this one out. It's available for sale if you would like. Uh, this poem is called Things She Will Never Know. You tell me about your affinity for Puerto Rican boys as I paint your face with makeup while your girlfriend is at work. Innocently, you speak of delicious caramel skin, eyes black as night, lips soft like pussy willows, and lean muscular shapes of bodies that you grip as you slide into them. Your eyes dash downward from mine, telling me this is true. A half smile starts the flush rising into your delicate high cheekbones, eliminating the need for blush. Um, this one is called Staring Down a White-Tailed Doe. It's kind of about, I live in a rural town and much of it is factories and um, people working really hard. So. Small town factories put the hard line on faces all of them in a vertical destruction of youth, skin hanging there like a wrinkle in time. Generations pulling long hours, sucking in black death, diamond death, poverty death. It is all tattooed on the inside of lungs, painted over eyes, along the jaw clenched unknowingly in earned pain. The subconscious is the only faction aware that there were once dreams of something more than making rent and car payments of cigarettes and six packs consumed. So this poem actually, we were at the same place at the same time, Tim. This was um, about a time when we read somewhere, I think in Kingston and we stayed at Rebecca Shimetta's house and Nate Graziano was there and all them good folks in Dan Provost. Anyway, it's called Sober. 
Meek and in the corner, she was the only one sober enough to hear me say I was going to the corner gas station for smokes. She sidled up to me and put on her coat, insisting. I shrugged, rippled with tequila and recklessness and walked out the door. In front of the house on the return, we had silent folded arms under stars, hers long and thin like bird wings tucked under, mine lost in a coat too big. She had something to say, I could sense, but not enough gumption to start, so I began speaking of the fragility of new love and old thin strangulations by men, hers physical and mine always mental. She recalled her year in a domestic abuse shelter, hiding with her daughter, and had I not been drunk already, I would have cried for how lucky I had been just to be lonely and isolated for years. We spoke of single motherhood, of making the grade in unsure times, divorces and mental institutions looming, and the two of us strangers, but together here, always grasping our insecurities with both hands. They are driven by false men's hearts. They are patted down by the unknowing. They are looked over by family, the embarrassment too much for any of them, and we swallow pride on a daily basis. We pour secrets into the night on streets of cities we don't know, just to somehow get by another day with a smile pasted on our faces. And when my cigarette is finished and our breaths twine in the chill of the night, there is a pause, some understanding, sealed with a nod before rejoining the others. This one's called The Recipe. Strip the green wire, he says, sliding a message beneath his quickened breath. You are beautiful. This is laced with passionate slow cooked onions and tender beef, making you wish for home and pride. He keeps secrets no man or woman will live to hear. Strip the green wire, or maybe it's the red. You are beautiful. Add olives, the green ones, without the pimento, and nine hard-boiled eggs, and you are beautiful. The dough has many layers, each with more possession than the other, and maybe I will have to kill you, Argentina style, if you ask how to make it. Strip the green wire. Or maybe the red. You are beautiful. This one is called She Still Smells Mango. And this it was something I had heard on NPR about um, a refugee. And her story really uh, touched me. So I wrote a poem about it. She Still Smells Mango. I get an inch of perspective in the early morning with air frozen around my face listening to a refugee speak of genocide. Her voice lilts over the radio, a mango tree, laughter, the vaulted imagination of children, all give way to massacre. She ran every day, crawled on her belly, knees bled raw, always thinking of food, dreaming of water. She's at Yale now, Rwanda a mixed memory of losses and delicate brevity. Through the blood, she still smells mangoes, remembers hope. And a little short one. Um, standing in line at the checkout counter. I create this world between us that is yet to exist, shaping the universe to my liking. For when it crumbles like gold plaster, my toes will have dipped into brilliant pools of light and glory. One more? I'll do one from a new book that I just finished. It's called Synchronicity. Clouds move slowly across the valley, stealing the sky from someone else's dream and drifting them into mine. Behind me, a large family gathers for a summer picnic, and this vista in front of me isn't strong enough to cut me from the longing inside to be part of a family again. I look out into the haze, the humidity palpable even in the shade, my clothes sticking to the light sweat running down my spine. 
I watch the gypsy moths wander like drunken fools in search of oak leaves, but they'll eat anything green. This summer, they swarm in a hostile takeover, chewing in a synchronicity so loud I can hear it push up on the breeze coming from deep in the forest. It isn't unlike the sound of the connection tearing between us, the fantasy of something unnamed perched on your lips without saying it aloud. And I find I miss the tense exchange of random questions and desires that felt like electricity. We aren't that different. Only the details of events shift our stories to one side of the line or the other. In the distant, there's a train rumbling on the tracks mixed with the sound of children playing and hot dogs cooking on the grill. And suddenly, I want to be anywhere but here. Thank you. Wow, that's such great work. And, you know, I was just lulled into your beautiful poetry that when you said one more, my initial reaction was, no, you've got to read more than that. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, we've gone back a long way and uh, we like we've been in the same journals. Uh, you've published me about a million times. I published you uh, in the How Do You Like Your Grits? But uh, one thing I loved about one of your uh, publications, the In Between Altered States, um, you published the most twisted things that I ever wrote that nobody else would touch. Uh, some of the themes that I had written about were uh, vagina sewn shut, uh, cookies made of crack, um, ruptured testicles, sliced off celebrity breasts, the who in Cincinnati and pencils and eyeballs. So was the rest of that journal um, as gritty? <laughs> I mean, I think so. Like I, I would put out just a super weird theme and, and see what people would send. And then once I got like one story that I really liked, then I tried to connect each of the other stories together in some way. So I would choose them and kind of weave them together. And I, I thought it was one, probably one of the more fun journals that I've ever worked on because I loved seeing that fringe side of people and, and giving a space for that. Yeah, and it's, it's, one, it's one of the coolest journals too. And some of your other work, you know, it's always solid stuff like micro paragraph line, exquisite, exquisite quartet, red, those are all my favorites. Oh, so uh, now as a writer, are you submitting more to eclectic journals because of your personal taste, or do you, or is it different when you're submitting versus when you're producing? I, you know, I like to, I like to be in the first of things. So I'll, I'll often look for brand new journals just because I like being the part of something that gets shaped off of that first um, issue. Um, I have been doing a lot more other thing, a lot of editing and review writing and covers and stuff. So I haven't really been submitting a ton right now, but I like the look of a journal is important to me, even if it's online. So now you yourself, uh, I found that it, you're saying you're taking a break from fiction writing. So how does one do that? And what was that decision based on? Well, I was part of a writer's group here in town and it was at the library and, you know, it would just be a group of people and everyone was doing fiction and I was the only one bringing poetry. So everyone's like, oh, it's nice, you know, and I'm like, oh, fine, I guess I'll write some fiction. And so I did bring in some short fiction and then everybody was bringing in novels and I had started a novel like in the early 2000s and never really did anything with it. So I'm going to unearth this novel and I... I wrote on it. I actually finished it. It's a hot pile of garbage, but I, it's, you know, I finished it. <laughs> and it was interesting to do this long form because I didn't do a lot of poetry writing during that time. And, but I think it helped uh, shape the poetry I'm writing now. Now, when you're in a writer's group, do they get your stuff or uh, you find that you, an outsider in writer's groups? Sometimes. I mean, it depends on, you know, uh, I think I had a lot of good times with this writer's group and it was large. I mean, sometimes there was 20 people there. Um, and yeah. And so they would, you would submit your stuff to the group leader and she would print it out 
and then everyone would get a copy and then they would put corrections on there or ideas, things they liked, didn't like, and then you'd get all the copies back and then you could go through it and and kind of just see what people felt about the piece. So I thought that was really helpful and also making a tougher skin when it comes to getting criticism. And I had created a smaller group off of that where it was just three of us and we were doing intensive work every week and just beating each other up and loving it. It was great. And uh, the work that's in your new book, did any of that come from that writer's group? So I'm really pro writer's group. Yeah, no, the, um, no, I don't, I was, because I was doing mostly fiction in the writer's group because the other two didn't really write poetry. So, um, but I do have a friend, um, this book that I just finished, who the book itself is poems written based off lines from other people's poems. Um, and it's called Borrowed Light. And it's, it's kind of looking at nothing is original, like we always borrow something and turn it into something else and so there's kind of a game to see if you can find the other person's idea or line inside my own work and you know, it was really fun to write are these famous poems and famous lines or did you like grab lines from friends and things like that well i did five different books and i took all the lines that i liked out of them so one of them was um chris donahoe's book plastic boats are melting um, Paul Corman Roberts, Bone Moon Palace. Uh, I did The Tradition by Jericho Brown, Tomorrow's Woman by Greta uh, Bella Messina, and then All Things Beautiful Are Bent by James Diaz. So it was kind of a mixture of small press and big press and um, just, it made me think outside the box because I've been a prompt writer for a really long time um, since my parents passed. And, uh, but this was, I where I conceptualized something bef beforehand and I had never ever done that before. So it was a, a really cool journey. And uh, do you recommend, uh, what would you tell a writer about writing from prompts? So what's the advantage of that? I think that, you know, since I've been writing so long, I can kind of get stuck in my own, in my own head, in my own groove and, and maybe not look too far outside my bubble and so I think prompt writing helps you to sort of reframe the things in your life and look at them from a different perspective. Now, did you ever do the write a poem a day for a month prompts? Yes, actually uh, looking for wild things is, is a year, it's a pandemic year, um, the first one. And it was April poem a day, that section. I did another section in November because I always write a poem a day for my parents um, in April and November because those were their birth months. And so this had two, two Aprils and a November. And in that whole mixture, I ended up getting melanoma. And so it was, it was a crazy little bit of, you know, pandemic fun and just going outside and trying to, you know, like when you couldn't go anywhere, like you said, the lockdown, that, that whole book was mostly about that, just taking to the river in the woods and kind of figuring out what life was really about, what was important. Um, and also what is important in life, your other book, Running Through Red Lights, you are basically, in that book, you're writing about what is missed in the world for people in their day-to-day -day quick paced life. Now, how did that theme develop? Like, that's not a theme to be like, you know, one day I'll just write about that. Well, these poems have been going on since like 2007. So I've kind of been collecting them over the years. And when I finally felt like, you know, recently that the collection was done, I decided to sift through it and put it together. But I, I do always, you know, I'm often, you know, the quiet person in the room watching these things that most people miss. And those are the, those are the great moments in life, I think. What do you think is missed most often by people living their rat race of life. That most of us are not that different, that we all have grief and pain. Um, there's small joys that we disregard because it's not maybe something super exciting to us. Um, but you know, being able to notice those things in other people can change the way they live their lives. 
Yeah, but I mean, isn't it okay to miss pain and suffering? I mean, I know that's kind of a coping mechanism. Yeah, I think so. But I think sometimes, you know, when we're, when we're suffering, just to have somebody else see us just for a minute, maybe we know that we're not suffering alone or that we are recognized in, in that pain. And you don't have to like fawn all over anybody, but it's just, I, I don't know, it's just being seen. I think everybody wants to be seen. So when you were 10, you found that this shoebox of your father's poetry and you had no idea that he wrote poetry, correct? Nope. Nothing. So what was your first impression? Like, do you, was there a line or a poem that just stood out of your father's that, and was well, he any good? <laughs> the first one that I read was called To My Blue-Eyed Babe, which was about my mother. And so it was this sort of love poem about her. And I thought, oh, that's kind of corny, but that I kept reading. And then he had a, actually a poem that he had written about me several days after I was born. And it was really interesting because what he had saw in me as a, as a baby is who I turned out to be. So I thought that was really quite interesting that you can have insight about people and write it down. Um, but he wrote poems too about, um, about coming home after Vietnam, it just uh, about what life was like in Man on the Street and things like that. Was oh, any of his work spare a dime. Like one of them was brother, can you spare a dime? Like, you know, just poems like that. Just some of them rhymed, some of them didn't, but it, I never knew because he wasn't really a talkative man. And so that he had all this emotion and, and all of these things to say was really shocking to me and really wonderful. Now, after reading some of his work or reflecting upon it, have you tried to write anything like your father as a ode to him or uh, is it just, you know, you don't connect in that way? No, I don't think, I think we're very different writers and, and different people, but I did actually, I self-published one book um, called Reasons for Never Sitting Still. And it was basically all poems about him that I self-published because I wanted him to read them and have a book. And I was glad that I did because he, he died suddenly a year later. So I was glad to have been able to give that to him and, and let him know, because we kind of had a, an estranged relationship for most of my life, but he, he touched me in such a way that it really, you know, it changed everything about who I am. So it was nice for me to be able to give him that book. So I don't think that I necessarily, that whole book was an ode to him, but not in the style in which he would have written. I mean, that's just such a wonderful story because I remember with my own father, he taught me to take my shoes off in the house. Yeah. <laughs> I always, I do that too. I know when he wears shoes in the house. <laughs> I want to talk about, all right. So this is, these are my favorite. These are durable goods, which is a, uh, which are these wonderful little booklets with four or five or three poets that uh, Alethea produced. And then they went into retirement. So they're back, but they're not back to people like me, right? Tell me about that project. So I think Scott's in the room here. Scott is a teacher um, of some really wonderful students in rural Missouri. And we, I had sent some poems into Rusty Truck to be um, considered for publication. And he got right back to me and he was like, oh, he's, then he started, we started talking about durable goods. And, and I thought he was, but we were also talking about his kids who were really like traumatized and had these terrible lives. And, and, you know, then he mentioned durable goods and I thought, oh, he wants me to bring durable goods back for these kids. <laughs> so I just was like, went on a tear and I was like, yeah, we're going to do it. We're going to publish these kids and show them what it's like and, and see if we can get, you know, people to, to kind of join in and subscribe. And our first um, series, we ended up having 70 people. Um, we had, yeah, we had lots of like, we had the poet laureate from Missouri. She ended up giving them like a Zoom teaching and a book and they had a bunch of publications, you know, Poems for All in San Francisco, he, they published them. So it's just this really wonderful, I, I was just so happy that they could jump into the community of the small press and see that there's something beyond these traumatic lives that they've lived in their short time, that they, though the trauma has happened to them, it doesn't have to define their life and that there are other wonderful things out there and that writing can kind of connect you with a bunch of people you never knew existed. So 
we're gonna we're gonna do it again this year. Um, it was a little bit of a free for all this first season. Um, a lot of really raw stuff um, that just makes your heart cry. And um, hopefully, we're gonna we're gonna do a little bit of prompt work, um, and we're gonna do some. Um, Oh my gosh, I totally forgot what I was saying. Paul Corman Roberts is gonna, gonna teach a little bit of a, a class in, um, a, do a generative workshop with them. Um, Cause he does Muse at 11, which is super fun where you're just like, here's an article, here's five things that you could possibly write. One of them is just lawless, do whatever you want. Um, and then you have 15 minutes to write and you get to see what happens. And that's really fun under the gun. I mean, that, that's really, really cool. And like, I, I'm a firm believer and I really admire the fact that you're giving back. You're giving back to the world and you're giving, you're introducing poetry to kids and you're publishing other people in various journals. Do you ever feel like you don't have enough stuff, enough time for yourself? You know, is there ever a what about me moment? That's, about that's me? why I don't have all these journals anymore, Tim. <laughs> Because at the end, when I shut down Durable Goods, I was folding over 500 pieces of paper a month. It was ridiculous. And I had no time to do anything else. Plus, I was still doing in between altered states and I was art editing for regardless of authority. I just had so many projects going on that I had lost sight of my own, my own journey as a writer. Well, that's what happens to like small press and especially online journals that are run by one or two people. The good news is they get popular. The bad news is that the staff can no longer handle it and then they disappear forever. Right. Well, it was a staff of one. It was just yeah. me trying to, to run three journals at the same time and work and be a mom. And, you know, it was, you know, I'm, I take on a little bit too much off, you know. <laughs> now, you're located near Buffalo. Is there, uh, or close to Buffalo, uh, is there a Niagara Falls area? Um, is there a strong riding community where you are? Um, well, I'm quite a bit south of Buffalo by like three hours. Um, I'm closer to the border of Pennsylvania than I am Buffalo. Um, well, is there a community between you and three hours in Buffalo? <laughs> Um, I think, you know, it's, we do have a, um, we do have a thing called Poets in Play here, which I just got an email from the Arts Council asking me to do a feature next year. So super excited about that. And it's a paying thing. She's like, oh, we got a grant from Poets and Writers. We're going to pay you $250. I was like, what? That's always a huge bonus. I know. I was excited. So I'll probably spend it on the kids anyway and buy them books. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, you know, it's, we're starting to, I just emceed my first open mic in town. We're really trying to like build a youthful presence for poetry. The poets in play tends to be a lot older people. Like sometimes when I would go to those, I'm the youngest one there and I'll be 49 this year. So, it, you know, it tends to be more of the older crowd. And so the younger crowd feel like their voice isn't really appropriate for the room. So you know, we've started with the, we have a local bookstore called Card Carrying, which is a feminist bookstore. So we're getting a lot of young, fresh faces in there and people reading. And um, I'm, I'm hopeful to create something around here. All right. Well, um, let me uh, mention once more, these are uh, Lethia's books and this is Running Red Lights. Mm -hmm. And this is looking for wild things. So definitely check them out. You can um, go to her website, alethiadramer.com, uh, and they'll tell you how to buy them. And, uh, you know, for someone that gives, gives back to the community, you know, give a little love to her. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's nice to talk to you again. Yes. Um, it's been great to talk to you as well. And, uh, um, Wonderful stuff. Uh, for those people uh, that are uh, watching on the Facebook stream, if you want to come in for the open mic, uh, feel free to do that and use the Zoom link. And, you know, I will let you in in order to do that. Uh, so I'm going to say goodbye to you guys on the stream. And also remember, next week we're running this show on Thursday night instead of Friday. It's a very special NBC must see Thursday. Uh, <laughs> Alethea, thank you again. It was a wonderful reading and uh, chat we had. Thank you so much.